Hello everyone. In this video, we are going to continue the discussion on the types of onset. So in the previous video, we have introduced the antipathogenicity and pathogenicity. The disease in our theories is a struggle between the antipathogenicity and pathogenicity. So once they fight together, how many types of onsets we can see from our daily practice for our patients. So as you can see from the beginning until now, the, the more we study, the closer we get to the clinic. The closer we get to the, the practice, so we will include more and more the clinical situation or clinical phenomena to show you some of the phenomena we can see from our daily life and also from our daily practice. So in this video, we're going to talk about the type of onset. The types of onset actually in from the, just from the name, we're going to discuss how the disease is going to happen. The first is sudden onset. The sudden onset they have some characteristics that this kind of onset is more likely to be attacked by the six exogenous factors, attacked by the pathogenous factors, attacked by several endogenous factors, the seven endogenous factors, and poisonous substance, traumatic injury. The first is the six exogenous factors. When people attacked by the six exogenous factors, the most common symptoms of fever, aversion to cold or, or heat, broken towels, and also the patient may, may be aversion to, to cold or have runny nose, slightly cough. These are from exogenous factors. And as you can see for all these symptoms, when I describe the symptoms, they are actually more similar to the common flu. Okay, so that's the exogenous factors. The pestinum factors, the pestinum factors, some pestinum factors, they will have sudden onset, while some pestinum factors will have late, later onset. So this is not Something definitely, but basically for the pathogen factors, it's more likely to have certain onsets, such as some of the virus infection. Such as the mumps. The mumps is kind of infection and this also can be human transmitted. So we cause this kind of Pathogen, we also consider as pathogenic factors. And for monks, this kind of infection, the patient also will have sudden onset. The endogenous factors, which means the, the several endogenous factors, is actually the emotions. So such as you can see from the even from the TV, from the from the movies, that's for someone they they were very angry and then all of a sudden they feel the chest pain or they have stroke. The something can happen in our daily life. The emotion changes. Sometimes we will affect the disease, will cause the onset of certain diseases, especially for heart attack due to the anger due to the emotion changes. That also can have sudden onsets. That's what happens immediately. For the poisonous substance, it adds some toxic stuff. The patient, the patient or will be vomiting. So that's also we happen directly a traumatic injury. No matter what kind of traumatic injury, we're going to be on set. 
the 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 happening going to be on set. So these are the characteristics of some sudden onset. Sudden onset. What kinds of disease pathogens are more likely to have sudden onset? The gradual onset. The gradual onset. The gradual onset refers to some disease that they happen gradually. You don't see in the process, but all of a sudden, after a long term, it can happen. This kind of gradual onset is more related to nowadays we consider as the chronic diseases, such as someone they they vary a lot. If you vary a lot in a very young age, such as in your twenties. In your thirties, you don't feel anything anything wrong, but when you go to your forties, fifties, you gradually you feel that something is not that well. And also can be overwork. Will cause like degeneration earlier, or some someone they like. Alcoholic, they, they like to drink. They drink a lot, and this kind of situation also will cause the gradual changes of of her, our human body, such as the for alcohol. It will cause the liver problem, and also more likely to have liver cancer. So this kind of changes from the functional changes to the physical changes. That's the, the disease, the development of certain disease. The later on, the latent onset. The latent onset is described in Huang Di Nei Jing. This attacks by pathogen wind in spring, one will contract diarrhea in summer. Attacked by summer heat in summer, one will contract some malaria in autumn. Attacked by some damp in autumn, one will contract cough in winter. Attacked by cold in winter, one will contract warm disease in spring. So from this description, we can see that if you attack by some pathogens in spring. You tend to have diarrhea in summer. Sometimes you you will say, "How do you know the diarrhea in summer is due to the spring?" So these are the description from Huang Di Nei Jing. And from here, from this description, we firstly we don't need to focus on what kinds of disease Huang Di Nei Jing described. What kinds of diarrhea that were affected in winter, in spring. And only happens in summer. From this definition, from this description, we don't need to focus on there. We don't need to even discuss what kinds of disease. But from this description, you can see that from Huang Di Nei Jing, we already know that certain kinds of diseases will happen later. Later, it won't happen suddenly. So this is different from the sudden onset and gradual onset. If we, if you still become, if you, if you still confused about the disease, there are many diseases nowadays we still can see have this kinds of characteristic. And give me any examples. Let's have. Latent onset. So it's actually quite common in South Africa, and you should find the example easily, such as HIV. HIV infection. After HIV infection, the virus, the HIV positive patient can live well for a few years, 10 years, even 20 years. 
that's when it develops into eight. That disease is not affected the, the virus at that time. The virus was affected many, many years ago. And then all of a sudden it happens with the later onset. It was affected, it was attacked years ago, and then it happens years after. Now again, we still can use the COVID-19. The COVID-19 we are we are experiencing we are experiencing now. What the government do or what they stress for for a quarantine? How many days or two weeks? Why we need to quarantine people for two weeks who have the higher chance to be infected? The reason for this is because. The COVID-19, the virus, the coronavirus, coronavirus have the characteristics of latent onset. You're going to, if you affect it now, you're going to have symptoms within two weeks after a few days. That's why we need to quarantine people for 14 weeks to prevent the further transmission. So these are some examples for later onsets and this as you can see the COVID-19 also mm -hmm. all kinds of later onsets and we also consider it COVID-19 and HIV as well as testinum T. So that's the same as the characteristics in sudden onsets which means that for testinum T it's not only sudden onsets, also can be later onsets. So these are the examples for the later onsets. The next one, the complicated disease. The complicated diseases refers to new disease may arise based on the primary disease. So in this condition, the patient will have multiple, two or multiple disease, at least two. This uh, combination of disease and overlap of disease. So this, this condition, the patient will have one disease, and after a while, another disease happens on the same patient. And this, the second disease is actually related to the previous disease. It can be the pathogens due to the pathogenic patho, patho, pathological products such as the stem or the, the phlegm. So these are the products of the disease and then you can cause further diseases such as someone suffer from asthma. And then after long-term asthma, they will have lung deficiency. I have lung deficiency especially for lung qi deficiency or chest yang deficiency. So that's the upper jaw deficiency. These will cause the heart deficiency and cause the heart paralysis. Now sometimes the patient will develop into a heart condition. So from lungs problem, they develop into heart problem. That's because complicated disease one new disease raised based on the primary disease. This patient, the heart disease happens on the base on, of the lung disease. The second the combination of diseases refers to two or more meridians. Meridian diseases appear in the same time. And the third overlap of diseases refers to the overlapping of two meridians in which they appear in the session and then coincidence. So these two, we don't need to distinguish the the words now here. When we talk about the meridian differentiation in the diagnostics, we will we understand what's combination and what's overlapping. But here it only refers to the disease of two meridians. 
such as Tai Yang Meridian, Tai Yi Meridian, when they happen at the same time. Or Tai Yang disease, Tai Yang Meridian and Yang Yi Meridian, such as the patient have fever, have runny nose, fever, cough, and also the patient will have aversion to cold. So this a headache. These are the symptoms of a Tai Yang disease. So when we study the the meridians, the differentiation from the meridian, you will you will know what kind of symptoms are considered as Tai Yang disease. And then in the same patient, this patient will have diarrhea and abdomen pain. Then this this disease is very similar to the disease that we say the the flu with digestive system problem. So that's the diagnosis in the general medicine. There's one type of, of flu that the patient will suffer from digestive problem. That's in Chinese medicine in acupuncture. That's this kind of patient is due to Tai Yang disease which are the symptoms we mentioned before and the diarrhea, abdominal pain or sometimes constipation these symptoms are Yang Min Meridian Yang Min Stomach Meridian so these are the Tai Yang and Yang Min disease so this patient suffers from two meridians Tai Yang Meridian and Yang Min Meridian in this situation we also consider as the complicated disease. So these are two complicated diseases, combination and overlapping. So there are two categories. This one also needs to be bold. So I'm going to make it bold later, but just from the video, need to Complicated is one category, the combination is another category. Okay. So the next one we're going to mention relapse. What does it mean by relapse? Relapse is also called reoccurrence, meaning that the disease occurs again after a period of remission and peaceful time without obvious suffering which means this disease has been clinical healed but it happens again after a while the characteristic of relapse is similar to the initial symptoms and this so the occur the reoccurrence For instance, the first time, if you have runny nose, avoid to cold, fever, and then you recover for a few days, and then you will have the fever again, then in this situation, we call it relapse or reoccurrence. If you got flu and then after a few days, you got a diarrhea, and then the, the diarrhea, and then the, when after the flu recovered, you got a diarrhea. And then when the diarrhea happens, you got a constipation, change it to the other opposite size. In this condition, in this situation, we don't call it relapse. There's different diseases. So for relapse, it must be similar to initial symptoms. Initially, you have this kind of symptoms and then you will heal, you will heal, and then afterwards, after a while, you happen again, but you will have the same symptoms, then we call it relapse. Difficult to cure, the more the relapse happens, the, the, the more difficult to, to cure. That's because the relapse, although we we think that's a clinical healed. So it's actually not healed, although we don't see the symptoms. 
The, re the reason why it relapsed is because they will be still have pathogens in the in the body. That's why the more the relapse happens, the more difficult to cure because this imply that there are still some pathogens in the in the body. Most diseases relapse are related to certain factors. This clause tells us that the relapse we have is not happening for no reasons. There will be reasons for the relapse. That's how we prevent the relapse. The types of relapse. Relapse after partial recovery. This means that the disease becomes worse again after the relief does not recover. So this is can be such as because of flu is a very common disease, it has be and I trust most of us are very familiar with the flu. So we always we always use flu as an example. The relapse after partial recovery. This can refer to such as the patient re suffer from flu and after a few days the flu become better so they have less runny nose. But so the patient would be would the patient is very happy, but it's in summer. So he play with other kids in the pool. And then all of the sudden he got fever. He got running nose again. So this is a relapse after partial recovery. The disease eliminates but hasn't been fully recovered. In this and in this situation, the, the disease happen again. So that's the one type of relapse. Alternating, alternating acute and chronic. In this situation, this acute attack and chronic situation, it comes and goes. Sometimes recovers, sometimes have the symptoms. These examples can be such as the pathogen due to the stones. The stones such as gold, such as gold bladder stones or kidney stones. It can be chronic. It can be like healthy person if there's no symptoms. You also can be acute attack. Such as someone suffer from the kidney stone, the pain is is crucial pain and referral pain. If someone have the gold bladder stones, they also have this kind of pain. So that's the acute attack. But if the, the attack was healed, the stones can be still in a in the gold bladder, but the patient don't feel anything. And from clinic, from clinical size, we don't see any clinical symptoms. So this is another type of relapse. We also consider as a re relapse, such as someone suffer from gold stone attack. So they have abdominal pain. And then after the treatment, the pain relieves or heals, but the stone is still there. This is considered as clinical recovered, but the stone may happen again. The abdominal, abdominal pain can happen again. With the same type of pain, this situation we call relapse. Lastly, the alternating onset and rest period. This kind, these two periods is the onset and rest period, such as asthma. Patients may have acute onset. They may suffer from asthma. They may suffer from difficult breathing. But during the rest period, they feel fine. Such as the chronic heart diseases. 
they may have the, the narrowing, the stenosis in the heart vessels, in the coronal vessels. So the, the symptoms can have, the patient can have a heart attack. Once you relieve, they can feel fine for a while, and but the heart, the heart attack can happen again. So these are alternating onset and rest period. So these are two, three types of relapse. Contributing factors of relapse. Relapse due to new pathogenic T. This is the example I gave you just now for the flu. The patient recovered, almost recovered, but, but he jumped in a pool. And then um, it got the center become worse. That's because the pool, the pool we have dampness and coldness. So in this situation, the patient, the antipathogenic T is still weak. That's why he was sick now. Although it's a recovery, but now there's another pathogen attacking the body. That's the coldness from the coldness, the coldness and dampness. That's the new path pathogenic T. So this example is relapse due to new pathogenic T. Relapse due to improper diet. This example also can the relapse due to improper diet and relapse due to overstrain. These also can use the, the flu as an example. Such as the flu when they recover at the beginning or the first few days or almost recover but then because the antipathogenic qi is recovery so the patient the appetite is coming back so they has they have the desire to eat but in at this condition they eat a lot of food or a lot of greasy food not easy to digest in this situation, the disease may come back again, such as the hemorrhoid. Hemorrhoid it happens, comes and goes, and then once the patient drink a lot of alcohol, or they eat a lot of greasy food, deep fried food, it may have the hemorrhoid happens. So these are. Relapse due to improper diet. Relapse due to overstrain. The overstrain can be mentally, also can be sexual activities. Overstrain such as some for some ladies, the uterus. If the dislocation of the uterus after deliver after the delivery for a few quite a few kids and then um, she did not rest enough and she can conceive again that's the, the uterus the dislocation will be worse that's also relapse that's the one of the symptoms this also can be other symptoms other examples such as a heart attack also can happen in this situation. Relapse due to abuse of the medicine. The abuse of the, the, the medicine can be from the doctor's fault, also can be the patient's fault. So it depends what kind of situation. In Huang Di Nei Jing, it tells us this. If we use toxic herbs to treat a disease, we only treat 50%. The other 50% we will use non-toxic herbs or we will use food as the medicine. If we use less toxic herb to treat a disease, we are going to heal the disease for 80% or 70%. 
So it describes in certain colors. It depends on the top toxicities of the herbs and how many percentage we're going to heal. The rest, we don't use the, the medicine. We don't use the herbs. We need to use the food as the medicine. So we need to use the food to help the patient to recover. That's to prevent the relapse due to abuse of the medicine. The last aspect is relapse due to emotions. The relapse due to emotions that's from the the disease due to the endogenous problem pathogens. These these diseases can happen to like men, especially for men, mental problems. It's more likely to happen to relapse due to emotional changes. So these are the types of onsets we're going to introduce. And these in these a few videos, these three videos, we introduce the the onset, the concept, the concept of the onset theories of disease. So from these a few videos, you will understand us why we become sick, why we have the we have disease. When you ask why, and when you have studied these theories, you will understand that we mainly focus on two aspects only the antipathogenic qi and pathogenic qi so in chinese medicine and acupuncture it's very simple to understand why we are being sick two aspects antipathogenic qi and pathogenic qi so although we have discussed all these three videos all what we discuss is the characteristics of antipathogenic qi, the characteristics of antipath antipathogenic qi, and also we have introduced the relationship between these two. We also we also can use use these theories to analyze. The phenomena you you have seen around yourself, around your family, around your friends. That's how to study these theories. You see, I got one feedback from some of you. That's he's. Uh, they said that the theories is not interesting. It's not as interesting as he is bad. You would like to more to have more practical study. But remember for the theories, acupuncture is very practical. We do have a lot of practical study in future. But for the theories, it's the most fundamental contents information we need to study at the beginning. The reason why is we use the in order to practice. In order to perform the practical training, you need to understand why we need to do so. If we we're going to mention some of this in the practical training, but if we don't have the blocks starting like this, we use a few weeks or one two terms, school terms, to talk about the theories specifically, you will not construct or you will not form a kind of systematic structure of the theories. You will have the spots, the spot, different spots of the theories. These spots of theories won't help you, will not help you to form a proper understanding of the whole theories. So, but for the practical training in the theories, that's the from mentally. You need to think about the in the phenomena you see as a human being. All the study we focus on acupuncture is from we study 
from ourselves. The disease we suffer from ourselves, we are human beings. We study on the disease, on the disease that we are suffering. So from the symptoms you see, you see in your daily life, you need to understand if you got flu today, why you have a runny nose? Why you feel cold? Why you have cough? What's the relationship among these symptoms? And then you lose your appetite. What's the reason you lost the appetite? How do you an analyze from our theories? You see, these are the practical training mentally. And the more you think about it, the more flexible you will be while you apply these theories in our practice. So in these few weeks, while we study, we, while we're still in the theories, do you think about the phenomena we, we are experiencing? such as we mentioned quite a few, we have mentioned quite a few times, that's the COVID-19. The symptoms of COVID-19, why we need to have 14 days of quarantine, why the country needs to be locked down. From our theories, from the onset of the, the disease, from the development of the disease, how we understand this regulations from the government. Is it you follow this or not? Think about this. The more you think about this, the more you think about, the more interesting it will be. Okay, if you still have any other concerns, you are more than welcome to email me. Okay, thank you guys. In the next video, we're going to talk about the pathogenesis.